So, I've been watching uh, Eric's video about reincarnation, or at least that's what he uh, wanted to, to start talking about. He ended up getting into the nature of everything, um, which I guess makes perfect sense. Reincarnation is one of those topics that um, always requires an infinite act of interpretation. Um, so, what Eric eventually ended up talking about was uh, the relationship of the finite mind, the jiva, to the infinite mind, um, which you could say is the Atman or the Brahman in the Atman. Um, and watching Eric think, it's, it's kind of like, I mean, what I see going on there is um, the finite ego discovering its own infinite nature. And, you know, when, when we finite minds start to try to think the infinite, we, we also stumble. We run into the limitations of our own incarnation. But the thing about human beings is, uh, in thinking our own limits, we transcend them. In thinking our own limits, we thereby come to transcend them. This is really what uh, transcendental philosophy is all about, I think. Um, this is what the Kantian revolution in philosophy is all about. It's the human being coming to understand uh, the uh, complex structure of their own thinking apparatus. Um, it's, it's about coming, the mind coming to understand the operation of its own faculties uh, to such a, a degree of systematicity that it thereby transcends those very organs of, uh, of cognition and of perception. Um, and what that really means is unclear to me because again there are issues of memory, uh, issues of, of, of incarnated uh, existence that prevent one from ever fully encompassing the nature of infinity. Um, but of course, when we start to think the limits of our own knowledge, um, we run into the limits of our own being. And the thing is, we don't, we don't get stuck there. When, when we find limits, when the mind finds a limit, it seems its its inner, its inherent creative capacity becomes manifest, and that those limits are always overcome, uh, and they're overcome because um, once we've understood the relationship between the various faculties of the human mind, we begin thereby to invent new faculties, or to have comprehended. Uh, the structure of human cognition uh, and sensation. One must necessarily have, have evolved uh, a new organ of perception or of conception capable of, of holding that understanding of the faculties in view. So every understanding of the faculties is itself, every new understanding of the faculties is itself a new faculty. So at this point, on this side of that historical pivot in the history of philosophy, Kant's, uh, it's often called the Copernican Revolution of philosophy, where the, just as Copernicus shifted the motion of the heavens relative to the motion of the earth by discovering the sun at the center, Kant shifted the motion of objects in relation to the subject by placing the subject at the center, making the subject and its ways of knowing um, constitutive of or constructive of um, the spatial and temporal activity of, of objects. So once the subject has been placed at the center um, of all knowing, once being itself becomes subject, right? So what there is finally is subjectivity the absolute subject, 
and we finite souls somehow find our, our way, we find our place within that one absolute subject, um, if we find our place at all, and it's not guaranteed that we do. Um, that's why philosophy is a desire for wisdom and not wisdom itself. But um, I'm going to go listen to the rest of Eric's video and maybe I'll have more to say.